that I would like to know first from each of you is what you think of when somebody says British to you. Like, what associations do you have with Britain or with Britishness? One Direction. Okay. <laughs> One Direction. Okay. <laughs> A boy band. Okay, T. That's actually an interesting one for a number of reasons we'll come back to. What else? Monarchs and Prime Ministers. What's that? Monarchs and Prime Ministers. Yeah, okay, good. Right, yeah, their political system is just different enough from ours that it doesn't make a lot of sense to us, right? What else? I think I accident. Okay. And what do you think of when you think of a British accent? What does a British accent sound like to you? Fancy. Okay. <laughs> and I think part of the, we associate a British accent often with kind of superior wealth and education, right? But I think this is because in the US, we tend only to hear the relatively posh, um, you know, like South London accent, right? That's what we usually get in American pop culture. Um, there's a wide, just as there's a wide variety of American accents, right? Everybody has an accent. Um, there's a wide variety of uh, British accents, right? Like, so for example, how many of you have ever heard Ozzy Osbourne? And you know, I'm just going to say, he doesn't talk that way because of drugs and alcohol. He talks like that because he's a working class Brummie, right? He talks like that because he's a working class kid from Birmingham in the North Midlands, right? That's just what they sound like. So class and region, much as is in the case anyplace else, right, tend to define what kind of accent you're going to uh, my wife works for a consulting company. Um, you know, they have, um, they're set up in various places across the US, the UK, and Australia. And one of the people who reports to her um, is a woman from the north of England. So every time I'm leaving the house and they're having their morning sync up meeting, I'm hearing this north of England accent coming from, coming from my wife's computer. So what else do you associate with Britishness? Or with Britain? Shakespeare. Okay, Shakespeare. All right, good. Keep going. Queen Elizabeth. Okay, which one? <laughs> okay, we maybe you don't think about the first one as much, right? And Queen Elizabeth and the current royal family have had um, kind of a pop culture moment, right? You know, we've got you know that TV series, The Crown. But then there's also um, this, you know, this new movie with Kristen Stewart about Princess Diana. And there's been this um, kind of constant press attention paid to Prince Harry's marriage, right? Which, um, you know, when I had, I remember a few years ago first reading the announcement that, you know, Prince Harry was going to marry this American actress, you know, it's like, okay, great, attractive rich person marries other attractive rich person, great, who gives a fuck, right? But <clears throat> the way this is played out in the British press, right, still says a lot about race and class distinctions in Britain. And in particular, the way Meghan Markle has been treated um, as a biracial woman in the British press. Um, has been, um, let's just say, like revelatory of certain consistent prejudices, right? And the fact that a prince married a biracial woman from the United States um, harkens back to certain political crises of the early 20th century that we will also be talking about, right? So is there anything else you guys want to note that you think of when you think of Britain or the British? <coughs> 
Okay, I want to go back to what you mentioned here, Jordan. T. Why do we associate T with Britain? With England or with Britain? Boston Tea Okay, the Boston Tea Party, yeah. Um, you know, when um, the Sons of Liberty in, in stormed the Boston Harbor, um, jumped onto a bunch of East India Company ships, right, and tossed the tea into the harbor to protest not a tax that was being levied on tea, but a tax cut that was given to the East India Company, so that they would be the only the only people really able to import tea in the U.S., right? So we do associate this in part with Britain's role in our own history, right? And, you know, Britons drink a lot of it, right? They drink a lot of tea. But what else is interesting about tea here? Does tea actually, like, is tea native to England? Where does tea actually come from? Does anybody know? Yeah, primarily India. And prior to the 17th century, nobody in England had ever drunk tea, right? So historically speaking, the association between tea and England is relatively recent. And it has to do with Britain's history as an imperial power which is something that kind of underlies most of the things we're going to end up talking about in this class, right? So this is probably a good place for me to introduce uh, the basic method that we're going to be using in this class, right? So um, everybody in this department uses a different mode of literary analysis, right? Or focuses on a different mode of literary analysis, right? So, if, for example, you took this class uh, with Jeff Waldrop, he would probably focus a lot more on you know, classic aesthetic theory and on um, close reading, especially of poetry, right? Um, if you took it with Jeannie Bryan, then she would most likely uh, be using a lot of feminist theory and bringing in a lot of psychoanalysis, right? My own method is what is referred to as Marxist historicist. This doesn't mean, before anybody freaks out and reports me to any of those, you know, campus watch groups or whatever, right? This doesn't mean that I'm trying to turn you into communists, right? This doesn't mean that I'm trying to affect your politics in any particular way. What it does mean is that I'm not particularly interested in the idea of the author as creative genius, right? What I am interested in is the idea of texts as products of a certain set of historical circumstances. So while we will be doing things like close reading texts in this class, we're always going to be doing so with an eye on historical context and on um, things like economic trends and trends in intellectual history, right? We're going to be focused on what else is going on around the text that informs its creation rather than on, say, things like the life of the author, right? So, um, you know, I know that, like, kind of one of the classic. Um, early undergraduate paper writing strategies is, you know, to start with a paragraph, um, you know, it's like, William Butler Yeats was born in 1860, like, let's just kind of get out of the way immediately here, right? really don't care about the author's biography, right? It's not that it's not important, but we tend to treat biography as though it's somehow determinative, right? As if because the author had these particular experiences, this is the only way they could have written, right? Or that, you know, they they couldn't write something that didn't speak to their own personal experience in some way, right? 
Um, so I want to try to get us to step away from the author a bit and look at what's going on in the period more broadly, right? So we're also going to be talking about audience and about the production and consumption of texts, right? Right, in what form are texts being circulated, right? How are people getting them? You know, are they getting a printed book? Are they getting pamphlets? Are they reading it in a newspaper? Whatever, right? And who's doing the reading? Right, who is this text intended to reach? Who's actually reading it? And what are they making of it, right? So these are, these are things we're also going to be concerned with in this class. Um, OK. So did any of you take Brit Lit 1? Nobody. OK. What's that? You took it. OK. So do you know anything, Grace, about Britain in the 18th century? Um, not, not really. No. OK. We only got to like the 17th century. Okay, who, you took it with, with, Walter. with Walter? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's not as interested, I think, in... 14th and 15th, and then 16th yeah. and 17th. Okay. I think, yeah, if you... Yeah, and then like another difference here is that we'll focus on different texts, right? So if you've taken that class, for example, with Dr. Ryer, you probably would have spent a lot less time in the Middle Ages and a lot more time on the 18th century. Which is not meant to be a criticism of any of my colleagues. There are things that I should probably be focusing more on, too, that I don't. So, for un yeah, sure, yeah. You don't have to ask. You can go anytime you need to. We're all adults. Okay. So, things that we need to know about Britain in this period to understand what's uh, <clears throat> understand what's coming, right? So, first off, it would probably help if we discussed some of the differences in social class structures between the US and Britain, right? So if someone in the United States says to you that they're middle class, what does that tell you about them? Yeah. So in other words, not really very much, right? And why is that? What's the problem with using a term like middle class in the US? People have What's that? People have it. Well, do, do, do we actually look down on middle class? That's the big, that's the problem, right? Is that it describe like too many people describe themselves as middle class, right? We don't have a traditional aristocracy. So basically, everybody describes themselves as middle class. So the term becomes essentially meaningless, right? Now, middle class means something much more specific in Europe, right? So at the top of the European class structure, traditionally, we have the aristocracy, right? So what's an aristocracy? If someone is an aristocrat, what does that mean? Um, yeah, this is the, the top of the the top of the social pyramid, right? And we are talking about maybe not wealthy in all cases, but certainly high class, right? High social standing. And we're talking about the aristocracy, right? We're talking about, you know, kings, queens, princes. Counts, barons, earls, things like that. Right? Essentially, people who come from the traditional landed gentry. Right, that is, people whose wealth and status comes from owning land, right? And from having owned land from a very long for a very long time that was granted to them by a king or queen. Now, below the aristocracy, we have the middle class. 
And middle class here means something more, much more specific than it does in the US, right? When we talk about middle class in Britain or in Europe, we're talking about wealthy, educated professionals. Doctors, lawyers, CEOs, people who are you know, executives in large businesses, right? These are the people who make up the middle class, right? So basically, middle class in Britain means people who have money, but not land or titles, right? Aristocracy tend to be rural. The middle classes tend to be urban, right? They tend to gather in places, you know, where there are large numbers of people and a lot of commerce, right? Now below the middle class, which is also referred to using the French term bourgeoisie, we have the lower middle class or petty bourgeoisie. which is really not a very nice thing to call someone, so you probably don't use this term. The lower middle class consists of small business owners. So say somebody who owns a pub or a corner grocery, right? As opposed to maybe someone who owns, um, you know, like a a large brewing company that supplies pubs might be middle class, right? Somebody who owns an individual pub or a small local chain of pubs would be lower middle class. The lower middle class person might actually have more money than the middle class person, but their class is determined primarily by what they do, right? And where they do it not by how much money they have. And that's one of the complicated things to wrap your head around, right, when you're thinking about uh, class structures in this sense, right, is that it doesn't have anything really to do with wealth. It has to do with who your parents were. It has to do with where you went to school. It has to do with what you do for a living, right? And all of these other factors that have nothing whatsoever to do with your income. Now, at the bottom of the class structure pyramid are the working classes. And the working class basically consists of anybody who earns an hourly wage. All right. Could be skilled labor, could be unskilled labor. The point is that someone else pays them to work, right? They don't own their own business or have a stake in their own business, right? And this is the way the European class structure has stood for a very, very, very long time. And this is basically the same picture that we have in the 18th century. So the things we need to know specifically about Britain in the 18th century, right? First, this goes back to the thing about the tea, right? Britain is an imperial power. Right? They are one of the imperial powers, right? Where they really excel is in naval supremacy, right? The British Navy in the 18th century is second to none. Their great geopolitical rival is France, right? The French and the British are always trying to get in each other's way, right? They're fighting over colonies in the Americas. Um, you know, they're fighting over trade routes in Europe, right? Um, in fact, you know, one of the reasons the French fund the American Revolution, right? is to spite their rivals, the British. So at this time, Britain has colonies 
in the Americas, in India, Australia, and its next door neighbor, Ireland. And in addition to the political empire, they've also built, through the East India Company, which was a private company, but which uh, the British monarchs, right, the British royal family, and prominent members of parliament all invested in. Through the East India Company, they traded in tea, sugar, and in slaves internationally, and built up a great deal of wealth in that fashion, right? Now, <clears throat> Kind of keep this stuff on the back burner for now, right? Because it's always going to be in the background of just about everything that we're reading. Right? This fact of Britain as imperial power. And let me just take a minute to explain to you a couple of things about law and government. Because this will help make some things that we read in a couple of weeks make a little more sense as well. So first off, does anybody know what the state religion is, or was, of Great Britain? Catholic? Actually, no. Um, not after Henry VIII uh, kind of saw to that. Protestant? Yeah, it's officially Protestant, right? And more specifically, Right, Anglican Protestants. So the Church of England is an official branch of government, right? With the king or queen at its head. So <clears throat> with the national character and the national religion being defined as Protestant, right? Being defined as a kind of protest against the authority of Rome, right? Catholics and non-Anglican non Protestants who are called dissenters. So dissenters would be people like Quakers, Methodists, Baptists, and early on the Puritans. Uh, were discriminated against and barred from public office. This was because in order for anyone, say, to you know, take a seat in Parliament, they had to swear an oath to the English monarch as head of both church and state, right? And if you were a Catholic or a dissenter, you weren't going to do that, right? Because it was against the tenets of your religion. So unless you were going to affirm your Anglicanness, you could not hold public office. Now this causes a problem in 1688. King James II, long suspected of Catholic sympathies, um, is deposed by his son-in-law and his oldest daughter. in part over his Catholicism, but also 
to be fair, James was also kind of a shitty king. And so for the next two years, in what's known as the Glorious Revolution, William's armies chased James across Ireland, eventually forcing him to surrender and accept exile in Europe, and leading to greater restrictions against Catholics and dissenters, right? Because now they're regarded as potential enemies of the state. Right? Their loyalties are to foreign princes and not to the English crown, right? So this is important in part because when we talk about religion, these kinds of conflicts are going to come up. And you're going to need to know, in particular, what a dissenter is. And also because the 18th century, we're going to be starting, after this glorious revolution, is extremely politically stable, right? That's one of the things that defines 18th century British life up to near the end of the century of the American Revolution, right? Is that things are remarkably friggin' stable. Right, you have you know, a line of monarchs starting with William III sister-in-law Anne, and then for about the next hundred years, the kingdom is ruled by a succession of guys named George. The monarchy in this period is really, really stable. Until George III starts showing signs of, um, shall we say, eccentricity uh, late in life. And the monarchy is largely propped up by the structure of parliament. So what do you all know, if anything, about Parliament? Apart from Parliament being the name of the premier funk band of the 70s. Yeah, Parliament is a Okay, so basically nothing? Okay. So... <clears throat> There were two parties in Parliament each of whom supported different factions, right? or di di different, um, yeah, kind of like, like di they represented different parts of the population, right? So the Tories were the party of the traditional landed aristocracy. Right, so basically what they, what they believed was in upholding the traditional privileges of the old class structure. Right? Keep that hierarchy intact. Maintain the rights of aristocrats um, on their own estates. Right? And the Tories' power base was primarily rural. Right? Mostly country gentry. Their opponents... The Whigs represented the middle classes and commercial interests. They tended to be urban. So, while Parliament was an elected body, 
it was not elected democratically necessarily, right? So I just want you all to hazard a guess. What percentage of British subjects do you think were permitted to vote in parliamentary elections in the 18th century? Pardon? 43. Okay, you say 43? 10 to 15. 10 to 15, okay. 20. I'll go with 30. 30, okay. Jordan is closest. It's really about two and a half. This was a startlingly undemocratic system by our standards, right? for a number of reasons, right? One is the prevalence of what were called rotten boroughs. So in any given district, you had to own land that was worth a certain amount of money in order to be able to vote, right? In a lot of depopulated rural areas, the number of people who could vote legally was very, very small. Right? You might have a borough where there are only two people who can vote, right? And so they can collude among themselves to elect a candidate who's just going to advance their particular interests, right? And who cares about anybody else? And if you own property in multiple constituencies, you could vote multiple times. So if you live on an estate that you own in Yorkshire, but you also own property in Shropshire, you could vote in both of those elections, whether you actually ever set foot in Shropshire or not. So not only was there only a small number of people who could vote, but certain large landowners could vote in various places across the country. There was also no secret ballot. When it was time to vote, you walked up to a little man with a book, and you told him who you wanted to vote for, and he recorded your vote. So everybody knew who you voted for. England and Wales in this system were overrepresented, right? Had a greater number of, of members of parliament proportional to their population, while Scotland and Ireland were underrepresented. And finally, given the way the voting constituencies were structured, Rural areas had more power than cities, even though more people lived in the cities, right? We actually see a similar problem right now reflected in the structure of our Congress, right? Or the Senate, because every state gives, um, gets two senators, regardless of how many people actually live in the state, that gives more power to, to like depopulated rural states, right? So despite the disparity in population, for example, you know, Wyoming has just as many senators as Texas or California. So <clears throat> we have a system that's stable, right? But that we can also see is very much tilted 
towards a certain segment of the population, right? And in maintaining their interests. And the reason why this is important for our discussion right now is that when we talk, you know, when we start talking about the French Revolution and its effects in Britain next week, right? But this is all kind of important background to uh, what's going to be going on with the literature. Now, the last thing that I do want to discuss actually kind of does get specifically, uh, more specifically concerned with um, literary matters, right? So this is all a historical background. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the way we split time up into periods, right? So for a long time, literary scholars have kind of broken down units of literary history into periods of usually roughly 50 years, right? So <clears throat> we call the period from 1700 to 1745 the Augustan age. From 1745 to 1785, we have what is called the Age of Sensibility. From 1785 to 1832, the Romantic period, just bear with me a second, from 1832 to 1901, the Victorian period, so-called because Queen Victoria lives and reigns for a dumb long time. From 1901 to about 1945, the modern period, and from 1945 to the present, the postmodern or contemporary. So, <clears throat> literary historians tend to assign a particular set of typical characteristics to each period, right? You know, they survey the texts that are produced in that period, and they look for kind of common threads, common elements, right? So, <clears throat> To give you an example, the Augustan period, which is kind of where we're starting our discussion, the Augustan age, is called Augustan for two reasons. Right? One, Augustus is the Latin form of the English name George. Right, and as we already noted, for most of the 18th century, the King of England is a guy named George, right? There are three of them right in a row, but yeah, they're all Georges. But it's also called the Augustan Age because the writers of this period were only an imitation of Augustan Roman writers like Virgil and Ovid. So I don't know, have any, did any of you take World Lit One? Okay, you've taken World Lit. So did you did you guys did you read Virgil and Ovid? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what if anything do you know about the characteristics of this period in Roman history? Or classical Roman, yeah. When we talk about the, Sorry. yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's funny. Yeah, when we talk about the classical civilizations, yeah, we're talking about Greece and Rome, right? Typically. And yeah, so what these guys are focused. Is there anything else in particular to kind of remember about the Augustan period? The Pax Romana, anything like that? Okay. So one thing to note about it is that it's 
conservative, right? It is culturally and politically conservative. And um, there's a great deal of state sponsored art, right? So, Augustan writers in Britain, right, and this is also sometimes referred to as the neoclassical period. New classical. Right? They tend to prefer urban social life as their subject matter. They believe in balance and moderate, excuse me, balance and moderation both in literary form and in the content of their works, right? So nothing that's too extreme, nothing that's going to get, you know, people, you know, feeling too frightened or, you know, too aroused or whatever without bringing it back in the other direction somehow. superstition anywhere. Right, they're practitioners of what they call decorum. And what they mean by decorum is that the style of a work should fit the content in some way. Right? So if you are writing, say, an epic, right, or you're writing in the form of the epic, then the content of that epic needs to be suitably elevated, right? You can't write an epic, say, you know, about a beggar shitting in a ditch, right? You write epics about kings and princes going off and conquering things. Or, you know, about, you know, justifying the ways of God to man as Milton tries to do and things like that, right? So the style, according to the principle of the court, should always fit the content. Now, the other thing about the Augustans is that they believed that art of whatever form, you know, whether you're making a sculpture or writing poetry, is a craft that anyone can learn with education and practice, right? It doesn't require any sort of special genius to become a poet. If you want to become a poet, what you need to do is work at it, right? Is practice, is hone your craft. And then eventually, or even if you, don't, you never enter the first rank of poets, right? You can call yourself a poet, good for you. So, the, this is the kind of general character of the age that we're starting our discussion in, right? And a lot of what we see in the Gothic that we're going to be looking at next time is a reaction to or against a lot of these Augustan values, right? These Augustan texts are written primarily for an educated, wealthy male audience. The Gothic is written for someone else entirely, primarily, consumed by another group of people entirely. But we'll get to that next time. Before I do uh, kind of give you the guide questions for next time I'll let you go, though, I do want us to to pause a moment here, and can you think of any particular dangers or problems with splitting literary history up into these kind of clean 50 or so year periods like this? 
mean, obviously it doesn't just at that year completely divide. So by splitting it, yeah. it might get into the wrong, like, okay, this is no longer this. Because I mean, it, it should probably like kind of just shift over smoothly. Like, it, over yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not like Augustine works and Augustine values and Augustine writers simply disappear after 1745, right? After 1745, a lot of these guys are still around, they're still writing, and are still influential, right? And you'll even you know, have texts that harken back to these values in later periods. So yeah, so it, tend, it, it can lead us to assume that literary values just completely change, right? And that older forms just vanish at a certain set year, right? Good, that is one problem, right? What's another problem? that might emerge from thinking of literary periods in this way. Were these periods developed after, like, looking back at it? Or were they yeah. developed at the time they're like, okay, now this is the age of sensibility? Yeah, good. Now, again, this is all retrospective, right? This is all looking back. And assigning labels to past periods. Yeah. Okay. Right. So then, I mean, I guess that might be an issue that wasn't was intended. Maybe. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. I mean, yeah. People aren't necessarily like getting together in groups and say, "Okay, we're the Augustan age now, right?" And this is how we're going to write things. Now, some, in some cases, you do have organized groups of writers with a particular style, who work together in a particular period, right? So, for example, we'll see that several of the early Romantics, right? Uh, Wordsworth, uh, Coleridge, and Robert Southey in particular did work together and collaborate, right? And were conscious of kind of creating a new movement or something different in British literature. But by and large, yeah, a lot of this stuff is just kind of happening unconsciously, right? So it's possibly assigning conscious motives to things that are happening organically. Yeah, Jordan, what are you going to say? I was going to say, undermine other types of writing that were big but not as big as Periods. Exactly, yeah. Anything written between 1700 and 1745 that doesn't fit these particular parameters, if, that's, if this is what we're thinking of as Augustine, right, that stuff tends to get ignored. And I think one thing that we do have to remember here is kind of the class and gender biases of a lot of the scholars who set these uh, periods up, right? They tended to be relatively wealthy, well-educated um, white men, right, looking at literature through a particular prism. So works by women, works by people of color, works by working class writers, and in fact, like works that were very popular, but might not fit this particular pattern, right, tended to get swept under the rug. So one of the things that I do, like, I think that, like, these ideas are like, these periods are useful, particularly for those of you who are English majors, uh, for kind of understanding general trends in literary history, right? And what dominant movements are in particular periods. But we have to be careful about applying them. That's the basic point that I'm trying to, uh, to make here, because they can also lead us into particular blind spots. OK, so does anybody have any questions about anything? I know I, I hit you with a lot of information today, but I promise that all of this information will become useful almost immediately on Wednesday. All right, so speaking of Wednesday, uh, I'm going to give you some guide questions for uh, the readings in the Gothic. Uh, you can just take a minute, take these down. My password is expired and must be changed. Um, interesting that my password expired in like the you know 70 minutes it took me to teach this class. Okay. My password expired today too. Yeah. And where is it? Okay. Getting back to the thing I said it would be poorly organized. 
Okay, so just take a minute, uh, take these down, and we'll see you all on Wednesday.